recording live from McNeil International Studios in beautiful Baja Tustin, on air with Mark McNeil. Well, here we are. I'm going to talk fast because I've got a lot to do. If you miss it, you're going to have to scrub back and forth here. Oh, what's this? Oh, warm and fuzzy. How nice. Oh. All right. This is the first of a series of markets. I'm going to do demand, I'm going to do supply, and then I'm going to do, uh, put them together and talk about equilibrium in markets and how it's achieved and so forth. So first we start with demand. Uh, demand is a relationship between, between price and quantity demanded. That is the price that somebody has to pay for something and the quantity that will be demanded in our market by buyers in the market. Now, when we talk about the demand, we have to be clear that we're talking about the demand for a particular good in a particular market during a particular period of time. So we have to specify the good, the market, and the period of time in order to talk about demand. Now, there's something called the law of demand, and it's not just a law, it's an iron law. The iron law of demand says that this relationship between price and quantity demanded is inverse. That means that if the price of the good goes up, the quantity demanded will go down, and if the price of the good goes down, the quantity demanded will go up. And this assumes naturally, ceteris paribus. That means that everything besides price that would affect consumers' decisions is held constant. It turns out that there are other things besides price that de determine the quantity demanded of a good, but price is the most important one. And that's why we make it the relationship between price and quantity, and all of these other things are held constant. So, why is this relationship inverse? And the answer is that when the price of a good changes, in this case, let's say, goes up, if the price of a good goes up, people will buy less. So if the price goes up, the quantity of demand will go down because of what is called the income effect of a price change. That's the first one. And the second one is the substitution effect of a price change. The income effect of a price change says that when the price of a good goes up, people's incomes are constant, and so they are able to buy less. That is, they're less able to buy the same quantities as before because the price increase cuts into their purchasing power if they have a fixed income. The substitution effect of a price change says that people are less willing to buy the same quantity as before because when the price of one good goes up, it makes the substitutes for that good look more attractive. So people will buy more of the substitute good and less of the good whose price has gone up. Those are the two reasons why when the price goes up, the quantity purchased goes down. Now, it turns out that we're after market demand here. And market demand is the horizontal sum of all individual demand. So what does this mean, horizontal sum, and what does it mean, individual demand? Well, I think I'm prepared to say it here. Here's individual demand. Let's say that I'm going to sell something. One pound bags of peanut M&Ms. What determines the quantity demanded in our market of these? this week. So I specified the good, the market, which we'll say is Baja Tustin, and the period of time this week. So, well, primarily it's the price holding everything else constant. If the price is $15, the quantity that one person, let's say me, uh, that I want to buy is zero. If the price is $10, I'll buy one. I'm an M&M, peanut M&M junkie. If the price is seven, I'll buy four. If the price is four, ooh, 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 I get seven a week. And if the price is two dollars, I give 15 bags and I even share it with my uh, friends and kids and so forth. Otherwise, I don't. Now, what? so if we were to, to diagram this, at a price of $15, the quantity is zero. At $10, the, pro the quantity will be one unit. So let's say that's one, that's that $10 and one. And then seven and four, so there, let's make this four. So at $7, there will be four units purchased. At $4, there will be seven units purchased by me. This is my individual demand. And at $2, there will be 15. Now, do you see that if we connect these dots and put a little D there, we have a demand curve, a demand relationship, and it shows the, the relationship between price and the quantity that I will buy this period 
for those M&Ms. So that's my individual demand. Now what if there were exactly 1,000 buyers identical to me? Now in the real world that's not true, but we would simply add each person's quantity that they want to buy at each possible price. So if there were a, a 999 more people like me, then at a price of $15, nobody would buy it. At 10 there would be 1,000, each buying one. At $7, it would be 4,000. At 4, do you understand how I have added everybody's quantity at every possible price? And since we put quantity on the horizontal axis, we call this the horizontal sum of all individual demand. So, um, basically, what would market demand look like? And the answer is, at a price of $10, at a price of $15, there would be none purchased. At a price of $10, there would be 1,000 units purchased. At $7, 4,000, 7,000, and 15,000. And so this would be market demand, the horizontal sum of all individual demand. Now, what do you know? What does this tell you, this demand curve? If the price is $7, it tells you that the quantity demanded will be, whatever this is, I can't read my writing, uh, uh, 4,000, 4,000 units. Uh, that's all it's telling you. It tells you every pro possible price and quantity combination for this good in this market during this period of time with everything else held constant. Now what happens if the price changes to $4? And the answer is that the quantity demanded will change from this quantity, 7 and 4,000, to that quantity and price combination, 4 and 7,000. So basically, if there is a change in quantity demanded, it's caused by caused by a change sorry, in price and it's a movement it's a movement along the demand curve from one point, let's call this A, to another point, let's call it B so a change in quantity demanded is caused by a price change and you're just moving from one point on the demand curve to another. That's it. So if, if you know what the price is, you can tell from that demand curve what the quantity will be. And a change in quantity demanded is caused by a change in price. You need to be clear about this because now we ask a different question. What if one of the constants changes? What if something besides price changes? What will that do to demand? And the answer is it will shift it. It will change everything about demand. It will cause a change in demand. Um, so what are these other things? Here is the list. The list of other things and the uh, mindless mnemonic device is in times past in times past really good beer beverages if you prefer existed now, in stands for income. If income changes, that's held constant when we draw this, this demand curve up. We assume the income in the, our market is on average 40000 or something. Uh, times past is tastes, tastes and preferences. Tastes and preferences are likes, dislikes, fads, and fears. These are things that are in people's heads about the product. Advertising if, uh, attempts to affect tastes and preferences to make it more preferred. Uh, if the government announces that apple pie causes cancer, that will affect people's tastes and preferences for apple pie. Uh, the third is related goods. It turns out that goods are oftentimes related. The price of one good affects the demand for the other. For instance, flashlights and batteries. If the price of flashlights goes to $100 a flashlight, it will decrease the demand for batteries because uh, flashlights and battery, batteries are complements. Whereas, um, I don't know, Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola are substitutes. So, related goods. Uh, the price of Coca-Cola affects the demand for Pepsi-Cola. Now, B, uh, beer, is the number of buyers in the market. 
by buyers, we're talking about the population, something the Census Department cares about. More people move physically, more people moving into the market. And finally, expectations is the last one. Whose expectations? Consumers' expectations. These are not just any old expectations. It has to be consumers' expectations about future U -R -E, price. Can we put that phone away, please? Sorry. About future price. Now, what happens? Let's say that this is the demand curve for our peanut M&Ms here in our market this week. And what happens, this shows every possible price and quantity combination, assuming all of these things are constant. But what happens if the... Um, um, what happens if the government announces that uh, chocolate and peanuts are particularly bad for people's health? Well, what's going to happen is, at every possible price, if the price, if the price is $10, there will be fewer than 1,000 units. All right. If the price is $7, there will be fewer than 4,000 units purchased because people will buy less at every possible price. So it may be like uh, 500 instead of 1,000, maybe uh, 2,500 instead of 4,000, and maybe after this change in taste and preferences, there's only, there are only 4,000 purchased, and instead of 15, there are 9,000. So what would happen to our graph here? And the answer is, at every possible price, the quantity will be smaller. The quantity moves left at every possible price. And when we connect these dots, we end up with a different demand curve. This is a separate demand curve. This is a change in, sorry, this is bad. Uh, demand. It is a shift of the entire demand curve. And what causes it? And what causes it? A change in any one of these constants. So, for instance, if income changes from 40000 to 50000 it's still constant again, but at a new $50,000 level instead of forty. And if income arises, then if income rises, then at every possible price, the quantity that people purchase would, would be larger. And so all of these quantity points associated with each price moves to the right, and this is a shift right. It's an increase in demand. Well, so here's my game with you. You need to be able to do it. I give you any market, like this is the market for eggs in uh, Irvine this week. So this is the quantity demanded per week and that's the price. What happens if, if uh, I don't know, I've done income, I've done taste and preferences, I've done, I've done so. What if the population increases? If the population increases, like they open up a whole new section of Irvine and uh, people move in. As they move in, regardless of what the price is, the quantity purchased of eggs will now be larger. This is an increase in the demand to D2, and it's caused by an increase in population, that is the number of buyers. So, this is an increase in demand and shift. What if we have the demand curve here, and my beautiful peanut M&Ms, they, they uh, come with a tear-off coupon, uh, $1 off. What, what happens? Will it cause an increase in demand to D2? Or will it cause a change from point A to point B? And the answer is, because it's a price change, because the price change is now a dollar cheaper, at every possible price, let's see, what am I doing here? Uh, at every possible price, I'm sorry, because the price is a dollar cheaper, what was uh, $7 now costs consumers $6, and the quantity will increase accordingly from Q1 to Q2. That's a change in the quantity demand because there's only a change in price. But if income, taste and preferences, price or availability of related goods, etc. changes, we get a shift. It's important that you distinguish between change in demand, change in quantity demand. Are there exceptions to the iron law of demand? I don't think so. If you find one, will you please tell me first? That should be good for demand. More later with supply.